Hello and welcome to episode 86, part 2, the Space Exploration Show for August 2019. How was it for you? Are you feeling like it's Christmas afternoon, having gorged too aggressively on Apollo nostalgia and now feeling ready to hurl? Or was the back-to-back documentaries and Twitter conversations just the tonic you needed to remind you of humanity's greatest adventure? Why the hell has it taken so long to go back? I'm Ralph, your host for this month. And I won't ask my good friends here what they think. Jenny's been drinking it in like a giddy tigger with a Hasselblad and a core sample collector. Woohoo! And Paul's the polemic iconoclast that likes to destroy the effigies of cherished memories wherever they raise their heads. Yeah, f*** Apollo. (laughs) (laughs) Do you know what? The thing is, you guys can't see me, but when I did the woohoo-hoo, I actually waved my arms about in the air. Like tigger? I... And I don't know, well, I don't know why I did it, because no one can see me. I'm just, like, sat in this room on my own, and I feel like a right t- <laughs> <laughs> Well, I've got to say, before we head off, I've been watching, I, I assume everybody's been watching a lot of uh, space stuff and documentaries and stuff on TV, but the first thing I want to mention is a film that I didn't get to see at the cinema that, um, that I managed to, to get hold of, which is called High Life. And if you've not watched it, it is really bizarre. It's basically about prison, but it's set in space. Mm. And I guess that's the point, that it's it's not meant to be about space, but because it's set in space, you can't help but notice that the stars are twinkling while they're in space. Oh, oh God. There's a glove that's in the space station in microgravity that's bobbing up and down rather than just moving with the momentum it should be. They're supposed to be mm. travelling... They're supposed to be accelerating at a constant 1G to get over the the issue with not being able to film all the time floating around. But they're, they've reached 99.9% the speed of light, but are still accelerating at a constant 1G. So the energy that goes into that, I don't, I have no idea. Um, and the, uh, no, 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 I do, I do. Go on. It's called bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. Because <laughs> as soon as you get to 99.9% the, the speed of light, the energy you would need to accelerate is getting close to all the energy in the universe. Uh, assuming Einstein's right, and we think he is. Um and uh, the spacesuits that they've got for the uh, the near vacuum of space are wholly inadequate. You can actually see that they are just kind of like toy spacesuits because the back of the helmet has no helmet to it. It's just cloth. So, uh, you know, there's no... Uh, <laughs> There's no kind of um, <laughs> bladder inside the uh, the spacesuit to create that um, inflation, um, and it's it's a film that doesn't need to be set in space. It would be far better if it wasn't. I don't know if any, any of you guys have seen that. I haven't heard of it. Well, that's a that's a, a ringing endorsement of that film, isn't it? <laughs> High Life, catch it soon. High Life, don't catch it soon. <laughs> but on on the other side of things, um, looking at the. Um, uh, the documentaries that have been out. Um, I don't know if you saw Eight Days to the Moon and Back, the BBC uh, documentary. No, I haven't seen that. Oh, you guys! I, this I is uh, so. This I'm is where they busy. they took the actual. Yeah. You can't do joy in this season. It's fifty years, guys. So, but, but some of us have been working on this, uh. like you know. Not yeah, just, not just same Z's. Not just tourists watching the telly. <laughs> some of us have been like you know. For some of us, this is real life. This is the shit we do day in, day out. Actually, mm-hmm. educating the masses. Yeah, you're living it. We're yeah. just, uh, we're just. What tourists. do you mean, we white boy? I'm yeah. a tourist. No, I mean me. You guys are living it. We're. Oh, I'm a right. tourist. Yeah. Yeah. It's... Yeah. So, um, eight days to the moon and back is a, uh, a horrendously sounding uh, concept of using the actual footage, the audio footage from Buzz, Neil, and um, and Mike in Apollo 11 and having actors kind of mouth it through the whole launch sequence and the trip to the moon and trip, the uh, the, the flight to the moon. Oh, that does sound like a nightmare. But it works really well. And and it's um, uh, the, the the visual effects are absolutely fantastic. It does look like modern HD footage of a, a voyage to the moon. And um, it's, it's perfect for people that don't know the whole Apollo 11 voyage because it just spells the whole thing out. Oh, I might have to have a look at that one. 
Now, some of the some of the bits of audio they used were a bit suspect. Why they did use those bits? Because some of it's a, a little bit dull when there's lots of interest in audio they could have used. But they did it really well. I thought it was great. Oh, cool. I'll have to check that one out then. Mm. On Twitter, yeah, it's well worth it. On Twitter, mm. I really enjoyed um, Apollo Fiftieth that um, account. Oh, I've not seen that. They one. were. Um, Oh, did you not? No. Oh my gosh, I was checking in with them all the time. They were live tweeting, so as, as yeah, it was sort of fifty we years were ago. I've been twi- retweeting them nonstop, um, but yeah, it was yeah, at it was... Apollo underscore fiftieth, and they've been live tweeting like all the audio. Oh, marvelous! Ah, mm. uh, brilliant absolutely brilliant so you know all the like quirky little conversations that they have and like the silly little jokey exchanges they have also all the technical conversations that they're having yeah um marvelous absolutely brilliant all like tweeted in real time so really one for the nerds oh yeah a massive mm. nerds boner over here but but that's like that's the apollo in real time yeah yes. which you talked about which last month. was phenomenal Oh, that that's been awesome. I I sat and listened to that when I had spare moments. I was sitting and listening, tuning into that, and it was just. I listened to the whole, the yeah, landing. Incredible. Yeah, I listened to the launch, live. And it was. I listened. I listened. To my daughter. We were sitting there in the evening, just sitting there, the sort of the sun going down, listening yeah. to the landing. And it it was like it was really happening, and it was. It was epic. Oh, it was amazing. I was so excited. And and they also did TV programmes, didn't they? Um, I think it was on Channel 4 in the UK where they did the launch um, on the mm-hmm. 16th of July, I think it was, and then the uh, the landing on the 20th of July, um, mm. as in kind of like doing it in real time. And all of those are just fantastic. You know, anything that you can, you can relive the experience in almost real time, just brilliant. That was my procrastination tool for like a week was Apollo in real time dot org. <laughs> I was like whenever I got fed up with like the code I was writing or whatever, then I just tune into it for like ten minutes and I'd flick between all the different people because you can listen you can tune into whoever you want, right? You can listen to the flight director, you can listen to Capcom or you whatever. And um oh, I was amazing. Loved it. Listen to the launch in real time. Yeah. I was like losing my mind in the office. I'm like, it's three hours till the launch. It's two hours till the launch. And they're all sat there. And they're like, yeah, all right, Jen. Oh, it was a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> I could not believe it. It was me and the summer intern were completely losing our minds over it. And everyone else was like, oh, okay. Like, why? Why are you doing a PhD in astrophysics if you're not even remotely interested in this sort of stuff? Like, how? Exactly. How? Why? Exactly. I don't understand it. Exactly. They really could like could not have given a rat's ass about it. <laughs> and it really, really annoys me when they're doing PhDs in astrophysics. Like, do they not care about this sort of stuff at all? Because like this sort of stuff, this is what like makes me want to keep going. Is all of this sort of stuff? Yeah. Like I enjoy coding and I like writing my paper and everything, but it's this sort of stuff that I love. This is the practical side of it. Well, it's the practical side of it. It's it's all the public engaging and actually getting excited about astronomy. It's all the inspiration that comes from it. It's like the background to so much. And like when Apollo happened in the sixties and the seventies, like the, the whole mission, like it was such an inspiration for millions of people around the world. And now at this fiftieth anniversary, you can see it almost happening again. Like it's spurring people on with Trump, you know, announcing that they're going to mm. go back to the moon. And very, I mean, you know, we're going to talk about it in the news, but various other companies going going to the moon, various other countries as well going to the moon. It's, it's almost like you can see all this this hype and this interest in astronomy and space and exploration kind of kicking off again. And I just think it's so incredibly exciting to be around at a time where we are going to start again pushing away at the boundaries because they were doing it in the 60s and 70s. They were really pushing our outer envelope. And I really feel like we're about to enter that time where we're going to be pressing on that wall and pushing it further yeah. back again. We, we, it does feel like we're um, that everything's all building up again now. And 
it can yes. never be as as fever pitched as it was at that time because of course that was the first time they did it and at a time when I mean yeah. we kind of expect now because it's been done before and technology has advanced so much in the last 50 years that it, it almost feels to us like well of course we could do it if we wanted to it's just about being able to get the money together to do it in those days it was can they actually do it so you know yeah. it was so much more of an adventure but, then, now- but we're already starting to feel that fever pitch building yeah but then what they had for the moon i feel is like what we could have for mars yeah. depending on how long they they take to do it yeah you know i mean you have to go back to the moon before you go back to mars like that that's just kind of like a given but you know when they were starting to launch all of like the gemini stuff and everything they were like you know edging their way towards the moon i feel like because we're going you know they're, they're just jumping right in there like right we're going back to the moon i really feel like this is how we begin to edge to Mars. And so m- the moon of the 60s and 70s, that is what Mars is going to be of like the 2030s or the 2040s or something. Yeah, I think you're right. But this is how it starts. And it's very exciting. Very exciting. But I guess we also uh, have have some sad news to mention well two two lots of sun news mm. really we do we we have uh we have to mourn well no let's not mourn let's celebrate the life of chris Kraft, yeah um who was the first flight director um of nasa uh, he was the inventor of mission control and he died at the ripe old age of 95 bless him that is an achievement mm. good in, in of itself 95 yeah. years old he was the flight director for the first American into orbit, also the first Gemini spacewalk. He was the director of flight operations for Apollo 11 and Apollo 12. And then he just kept on going up from there. He went to deputy director of Manned Spacecraft Center and just climbed his way all up to the top. But if it wasn't for him, then mission control would not have been a thing. He invented yeah. it. And what, he, what we recognize now no. as mission control is what he developed and created. Yeah. Like, he... Yeah, he just invented that entire framework and you know, would would the missions have gone so smoothly and so successfully as they did if we didn't have that framework of mission control, you know, where everyone's together and everyone's got their job and everyone's got their place and that well oiled machine, would it have all happened so nicely? Maybe not. Hmm. But yeah, wonderful man who achieved many things. So yeah, we, we honour Chris Craft on our podcast. And our second piece of sad news is, unfortunately, Mandela Maseko, um, who was a South African um, Air Force corporal, um, a former DJ as well. He had won the chance to become the first black African um, to train as an astronaut um, and was going to go to space. Unfortunately, he died in a motorbike crash uh, last month, um, so it's not to be. So a bit of bad news there. Yeah, and uh, we don't hear much about uh, space flight in you know kind of non-Western countries, um, but you know there are so many efforts going on, and you know we we talk quite a bit about well not not really quite a bit we talk about China and we talk about India with their robotic missions, but there's all sorts of endeavours going on around the world, and of course in 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 non-Western countries these are often ways of being able to um, really propel uh, technology in these countries that, that can mm. be transferred into other sectors as well. We t- kind of take for granted the technology that we develop in these countries and almost use that as a selling point for, for space programs. But in other countries, it can be such a um, such a boost to the country's economies and technological development. And it's really sad when we hear that, you know, the setbacks like this and of course obviously you know the distress that, that causes to the families of uh, of people that you know lose their lives um when you know they have this opportunity for kind of immortality in in their countries yeah well i mean when you when you consider the the the, the tim peak effect in of Britain, course yeah you know which is which is a you know sort of uh, we we've done space for a while and we've done it, but you know even even today you know an astronaut has had such a massive impact um, to have your 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 first astronaut and and some someone um, you know, in South Africa from from a part of the population that in the past because of course we had Mark Shuttleworth in the past a white South African mm. who's who's already yeah. paid for his way to go to space um, you know this this would have been something really big and really you know sort of 
challenging for for um, stereotypes and education mm. and things like that. And unfortunately, not to be at the moment. Yeah, cultural, not just technological advancement. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Mm-hmm. Okay, so moving on to the emails from our good friend Lee Stevens in the US, uh, who titles his email, Analysis of Why We Haven't Been Back to the Moon. Uh, Lee says, Oh, magnificent Martian malefactors, your groveling subject to be abases himself before you, your munificent malicious majesties, as well as your venerated vivacious viceroy Jen. God, I love that alliteration. That I is am. magnificent. Oh, that, that so was, proud of you. That was some that. sexy alliteration there. <laughs> That was amazing. That was one take. And I couldn't even read that in my head oh. in one take when I was reading the email, let alone reading it so out well loud. So well done, Lee. That is fantastic alliteration. Uh, Lee goes on to say, This miserable minion, continuing the alliteration, begs the temerity to proffer the following scribblings as possibly have some minor value in your learned discussion as to why us inconsequential earthers have dallied so long in going back to your nearest celestial neighbour. If you find it slightly pleasing, please continue to spare the Pacific Northwest from your righteous wrath, your faithful servant, Lee Stevens, in Bellevue, uh, Washington State. And he links to an article on the ArsTechnica.com website, which it basically points the finger at the uh, political lack of will to spend so much money currently and the lack of geopolitical uh, adversary as a foe uh, since the Cold War. Now, Ars Technica, I don't know if you've seen these articles. Um, it's, it's only something that I've, I've noticed recently as a, um, as a website, but they do have really good, uh, I've not looked at their wider mm, they do. articles, but certainly the ones that have been on the space race that I've looked at and their astronomy articles are really good and really well considered. Um, and this article points to um, strong will from the current president and commercial space providers. Uh, and, and the space ambitions of China suggest that the time might be right to return. And I've got to say that, you know, these are the kind of um, tropes that we look at and we think, yeah, these are the, 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 the requirements that we need for, for a strong effort in space. But it was still a really good article. So thanks for pointing that one out, Lee. And, and Ars Technica is a really good website, certainly for the, uh, uh, the space articles. Well, after a few months of feasting on Apollo nostalgia, I imagine you're all pooped out on retro moon shenanigans, aren't you? So, looking forward rather than back, what's in the space exploration news this month, Jen? First up is the simply astounding Hayabusa 2. Aww. This plucky little robot satellite was launched some four and a half years ago from Japan, and boy, has it been wowing us ever since. Mm. Its mission is to image and sample asteroid Ryugu, which orbits the sun between the Earth and Mars. And it's only about half a mile wide, so it's quite small, really. And the big aim is to actually return some of those samples to Earth. Mm. But it's not just samples from the surface it's after, but samples from beneath it. Mm. And it seems that Hayabusa 2 is well on its way to achieving this goal. So back in April... Uh, the satellite blew a little hole in the side of the asteroid and this time the challenge was to extract some of that unearthed debris. The craft flew low over the surface of the asteroid about 65 feet away from the crater it made a few months ago landed, fired a bullet at the asteroid's surface to dislodge some of the debris from the crater it made collect this into a horn and then rapidly ascend again and by rapidly I mean all of that from, you know, landing onwards was all done in about a second. Whoa, I didn't read that. Which I think is pretty cool. Yeah. So, this success marks the beginning of the end for Hayabusa 2. It's got one more rover left to deploy, and then it's going to be heading back home, where scientists are going to be examining the material to understand the geological history of the asteroid, which will hopefully reveal secrets of the formation of the solar system. Ooh. Ooh. Nice, yeah? Okay, so, next up, moon fever still sorry guys but instead of looking to the past we're going to look to the future and this <laughs> is the announcement of a collaboration from toyota and jaxa which is the japanese aerospace exploration agency to develop a pressurized lunar rover which i guess is what they what they mean is a bit like that one that's in the film the martian where he doesn't have to wear his spacesuit inside mm-hmm. it 
So the prototype is set to be made in 2022 with a real version in 2027 and then it launches in 2029. So the rover is going to be used to search the lunar poles for resources and also as practice for other larger targets in the solar oh. system. So says the press release. Mm. Mm. Now this timing is no accident because NASA, they want to go to the South Pole by 2024 yep. and they've got plans for a base there. ESA have also got similar plans. So a pressurised vehicle could mean a much longer range compared to the almost go-kart-like appearance of the first lunar rovers from the 70s. And so who knew it? Maybe the Prius is the future after all. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, you've got the Japanese are um, a well-established partner in the International Space Station and with the Americans at NASA. So... You know, you could well have Toyotas on the on the surface of uh, of the moon in in not too long as part of NASA's uh, Project Artemis. And uh, mm-hmm. well, we all know that Toyota four by fours last longer than any other vehicle. So why wouldn't you send one up to the moon? Exactly. And finally, it's time to celebrate with India as they launch Chandrayaan two. Whoop whoop! <laughs> it's heading for the moon. Yeah. More specifically, it's heading to the Lunar South Pole, which we know the Americans and ESA and everyone else is very, very interested in. So it's due to get there on the 6th of September and it's going to launch a rover and a lander to land on the surface. Now, it's not just a carrier. It's packed with cameras and spectrometers for data collection as it orbits the moon. And the orbiter is expected to last for about a year and the rover and the lander are expected to last for about two weeks. Uh, This is because they're not expected to survive the cold of the lunar night. And they're hoping that the mission is going to expand on our knowledge of the moon and pave the way for more extensive missions in the future. Look out, NASA and ESA. And all of this from a mission costing less than $150 million. What? Boom. Yep, less than $150 million. Wow. Wow. Very impressive. They've got a lander and a rover because the lander's got the rover inside it. Yeah. And then the lander's going to land and then deploy the rover. And they've got an orbiter, which is actually Chandrayaan 2, is going to be up there for a year as well with cameras and spectrometers and stuff in it. If America did that, it would cost at least half a billion. Oh, yeah. It's amazing what you can do when you have to. Paul. Right then, so... Epic missions. Epic missions don't come along very often, but ESA has just announced a mission of sci-fi proportions. Oh. Yeah. Remember Umwamwa? I do indeed. Um, 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 um. <laughs> Remember Umwamwa? Yeah. The interstellar interloper who we picked up in 2017 after it passes by. Was it really two years ago? I know, ago? exactly. I, I, do you know, when I, when I was reading this, I was like, really? And it's like, yeah. It's amazing, isn't it? Wow. Well... There was fanciful talk at the time of a spacecraft to catch it up, of course. Yes, um, I that. that was just wishful. Yeah, yeah, that was wishful thinking. Well, a British-led mission is not going to be caught napping next time. Comet Interceptor. Oh. Already, you're, you're getting a little... Oh, a little ears have pricked up at that. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Ooh. You're getting a little aroused Isn't that the that name of the is. car in yeah. The Professionals, or was it the Sweeney? Oh, no, the interceptor was um, uh, Mel Gibson. That was um, Mad Max. Uh, Mad Max, wasn't it? it the interceptor. Was, yeah. um, Comet interceptor. It's going to be launched in 2028 on an Ariane six um, alongside Ariel, which is ESA's exoplanet ah. atmosphere mission. Um, the interceptor will be sent to the L two Lagrange point, and like a fighter plane on patrol, it's going to be ready to chase down an interstellar comet when spotted. Or, oh. if no suitable candidate is found, a pristine Oort cloud comet will be chased. Whoa! Oh I my know. god, it's just gonna like sit there biding its time. Yeah, exactly. It's like something out of a sci fi thing. Yeah, it's oh like, my, dun, 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 oh dun, my dun, god, dun, that's dun. so cool. I know, exactly. And as it get, but hang on, it gets cooler. As the target comes into sight, okay, about a week before this, as it gets there, hmm. it splits into three. Huh? Okay, so. Um, There'll be two sub-satellites, B-1, which is coming from Japan, B-2. Um, they'll break off, and they'll fly close to the, ob- the object, sort of each side of it. And then the main craft, called A, 
will shoot over the top or bottom, don't know how you view it, um, and but be a bit further away and get a bigger overview um, and act as the comms vehicle. But together, they'll see the whole comet in the past. They'll see the whole thing, and they'll, and they'll be able to map it all in 3D Whoa. and do other things. So, in a word, epic. Oh, my God, this is Just so like, cool. Like, yeah. How cool is that going to be? That is amazing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's British lead. That's a British lead, yeah. That British sounds far lead. too cool to be a British lead mission. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> they're all going to be wearing like flying helmets and handlebar moustaches. Of course right, does they it, are. <laughs> Smoking a pipe. Smoking a pipe. Exactly. Um, now, next up, this was trailed in the last episode, is Punch. P-U-N-C-H. Which is the polarimeter to unify the corona and heliosphere yeah. and i'm now going to go away and hurt Die someone a little bit for yeah. that yeah exactly um but anyway this is a formation of micro satellites which are going to be launched in 2022 to study the outer corona and how the solar wind comes from it and goes off to form the heliosphere and these are going to be little micro satellites 40 kilograms each and they'll fly in formation 570 kilometers above the earth Three of them are going to have wide field cameras um, and they will look for sunlight scattering off the electrons in the solar wind while a fourth will have a narrow field camera which will be just for looking at the corona. Um, so that, what we were talking about, the sort of formation of um, mm. you know, you know, telescopes in space um, working together to look at an image, well, here it is. Um, and there's, ah. there's some British involvement in this. Um, of course, this is uh, in the form of camera detectors from... Um, RAL space the it's been likened to this is actually like a weather satellite system mm. but for looking at the oh. sun so this is all yeah. part of this sort of space weather idea um, and finally a brief mention for the successful Orion capsule abort test yes. at the start of July yeah which brings the Orion missions a little bit closer it was really spectacular it was really cool, cool. Mm. Um, abort test works so that's good and um, and then also the announcement that NASA wants to open up the ISS to fair-paying passengers, because what space needs is overprivileged elites demonstrating their huge wealth on taxpayer-funded platforms. Of course. Oh, but about. you reckon? I reckon there'll be loads of competitions now. Yeah. Got to keep the peasants yeah. happy. Give the peasants just enough yeah, sinecures exactly. that they don't revolt. Every <laughs> for every one hundred rich people, you've got to throw a freebie in. Of course, you have. <laughs> and I think I also saw on the NASA website that they're saying that uh, Orion is now completed. Yes, it is. They've they've actually that. Do you know what? That, they, I should have added that in. That's um, Artemis One, as they're now referring to it, is yeah, now ready. Twenty twenty one. It's ready to go. Twenty two. Yeah, Just the... it is ready. Oh, they're calling it Artemis One. Artemis One. Yes, they tweeted the other day, and there was there was the capsule sitting attached to the serve the European service module. Mm. The Artemis One spaceship is assembled and ready. And as we now know from your news article last month, Paul, that's just preparing the way for Artemis 3, which will be the next human landing on the moon. Exactly. But Artemis 2, which of course will be the rerun of Apollo 8. Yep. And then yep. Artemis 3, which will be Apollo 11. Landing. Yeah. So, and yeah. Yeah, baby. And, and, and paving the way for all of that, um, NASA has selected... 12 new lunar science technology investigations um, and I'll run through them quickly um, because this is the kind of pathfinding proving the way ready for um, a, a lunar presence let's say a, a human extended presence on the moon which is the the ultimate goal of this administration so the most exciting of them are the moon ranger which is a small fast moving rover that's got the capabilities to drive beyond communications range with a lander and then return it to continually map the terrain it traverses. There's a demonstration of a radiation tolerant computing technology to find ways to protect systems needed for long duration lunar visits from the constant radiation because of course most electronics and computers mm -hmm. need radiation hardening. You can't just send normal computers up there because the radiation environment's too harsh for it. The lunar magnetotelluric sounder, which I just want to keep saying over and over again, magnetotelluric. That's a very cool name. Uh, this is going to characterize the structure and composition of the moon's mantle by studying electric and magnetic fields. 
The next generation lunar retro reflectors serve as a target for lasers on Earth to precisely measure the Earth-Moon distance. So if you remember the Apollo experiment of putting retro reflectors on the Moon so that you can measure the distance, that's how we actually know the distance and the, the, the rate that the Moon's moving away from, from the Earth. This will be kind of like a more accurate version of that. Cool. PlanetVac is a technology for acquiring and transferring lunar regolith from the surface to other instruments to analyse the material or put it in a container that another spacecraft could return to Earth. And samplers, mm-hmm. another sample acquisition technology that'll make use of robotic arms that a, um, uh, that's a, a flight spare, if you like, from the Mars Exploration Rover mission. So that's the mission that includes Spirit and Opportunity to be able to sample stuff on the surface of the moon. So I guess... Uh, this is all technologies that are proving the way and gearing up for those Artemis flights and, and the, the later 2028 mm. and beyond missions when uh, the, the plan is for um, a constant human presence on the moon. But something that's going to be news to, to Gen Z is, is that what this is really doing is, and, and like it was with Apollo and the stuff that gets missed beforehand with the uh, the surveyor missions and, and the missions that preceded the Apollo landings, there is so much that had to be learned about the lunar environment and still has to be learned now to be able to make the Artemis and the long goal of Artemis possible. It also feeds into that understanding of planetary science, of lunar science, and just human understanding of this environment that we live in or that extended environment that we live in. Mm-hmm. It's very exciting. It is. Mm-hmm. The science very the science that we get from this is going to be phenomenal and it also has a practical use for exploration. The only fly in the ointment, of course, is we're still waiting on a budget. Mm. Yeah. Not, they, they they keep talking about it. They were talking about it during the Apollo celebrations. Yeah. We've got to see the cash. We've got, we got to see the wallet open. But the thing is that even if you're a, a, an Apollo and an Artemis cynic, you know, you don't see the point in spending all that money on human exploration of this planet. Nobody would, well, nobody that's going to be listening to this podcast would begrudge the robotic exploration of, of other bodies. No. So we're getting that just as part of the Artemis plan. All this has been accelerated and probably wouldn't go ahead if it wasn't for... Trump's plan to go back to the moon. So, you know, I've said it before and I'll keep on saying it. I am no fan of Trump at all, but we're getting we're getting this space and planetary science as a precursor to that. And even if we don't end up going to the moon, I'll certainly take this science that we're getting. Cool. Order, order. Court is in session now. It'll be my duty today to determine which one of the spacecraft presented before me will be granted its liberty. Upon presentation to the court, it'll be my judgment based solely on facts and evidence provided by this case. Ms. Mellard, please approach the bench and inform the court whom you'll represent and state your case. If it please, my lord, honoured members of the jury, I'd like to argue the case for the space telescope Kepler. Please do. If you walk up to a random person on the street and ask them, have you heard of the space telescope Kepler? They'll probably quickly walk in the other direction shouting, sorry, not today, must get to work. I cannot deny that Kepler isn't a household name. Indeed, this powerful workhorse of the astronomy world is relatively unknown outside schools of research and the clubs of passionate amateurs. For now. In time, this telescope... Nay, this mission, for she is so much more than just an eye on the skies, will go down in history as the one who saw first. Just as we remember the explorers and adventurers who saw first, Armstrong, Columbus, Cook, Cortez, Drake, Hillary, we will remember Kepler. All these explorers changed the way we see the world around us, expanded our horizons opened our eyes to possibilities only previously dreamed of, and what bigger dream is there than worlds elsewhere? Prior to the launch of Kepler some ten years ago, we knew a handful of exoplanets, worlds orbiting stars that were not our own. A few were around stars like the Sun, most were not. These tantalising peeps through the keyhole drove astronomers to play a risky game of dice, and launch a telescope built to search for these other worlds without having 
any idea of how many it would find. It could find thousands. It could find just a few dozen. Nobody knew. This was a bold move. Based upon the handfuls of systems already seen, astronomers had hundreds of burning questions about the stellar systems in our galaxy. What sort of planets exist? Are they like the planets in our solar system? Can you get planets orbiting two stars? Is our solar system unique? Are multiple planets common? But before any of these could even be thought about, we had to answer the basic question. How many stars play host to a planet? This was the question. The question that has plagued the astronomy world for centuries, long before the invention of the telescope, when the worlds of our own system were first resolved into anything more than a pinprick in the blanketing darkness above. Put another way, the question was simply this. Are we alone? So, in 2009, astronomers pinned all their hopes on a plucky little mission that was sent a million miles away from Earth to stare at a patch of sky near Cygnus and wait. Wait for the heavens to wink and wink and wink again. Kepler waited and watched and she saw. Oh man, she saw. For years, Kepler kept watch and saw thousands of the 150,000 stars in her field of view briefly blink as they betrayed the presence of thousands of planets, each one a little different. Kepler found gas giants whizzing past their host star in a matter of hours. She found frozen worlds taking months or years to lazily drift around their host star. She found many worlds orbiting one star and some worlds orbiting many stars. Kepler found worlds unlike anything we could have imagined. Worlds that simply do not exist in our solar system. And, whilst we're on the subject of our solar system, Kepler showed us that we are unique. A system like ours, with inner rocky planets and outer gaseous planets, orbiting at a variety of distances, some within the habitable zone of their star, is yet to be found. But... She did show us worlds basking in the habitable zone of their host stars, a zone that she herself helps to define. And Kepler answered so many questions and raised so many more, and that was with just her first mission. Battered and bruised by the harshness of the void, with just two gyroscopes left to steady her, Kepler began her second mission, to study stars along the ecliptic. During this mission, hundreds more exoplanets were added to the thousands already found. Kepler ceased to function last year, some five and a half years after her expected end date, after she ran out of fuel. But her mission is not over yet. To date, we know of over 4,000 exoplanets discovered by her, and there are thousands more just waiting to be teased out of the data. But Kepler's legacy is not just the simple result of a counting game. Kepler has completely revolutionised the field of exoplanets, and that is no exaggeration. Thanks to Kepler, we now know, not hope, that the number of planets outnumbers the number of stars. We know that small planets, like our Earth, are common. We know that planets are far, far more diverse than our solar system ever indicated. We know that solar systems are diverse, some far stranger than ever imagined. And let's not even get started on everything we know about stars now, thanks to almost a decade of staring at the sky. Isaac Newton once remarked, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. Kepler is the giant. Kepler was the beginning. Kepler saw and whispered, you are not alone. And Mr. Hill, would you like to begin the defence for your client, the Hubble Space Telescope? Ah, uh, my lord, my learned friends, members of the jury. It was Herman Oberth, one of the key founders of rocketry, that first proposed it in 1923. Three years later, in 1946, it was Lyman Spitzer who formally proposed the idea in a paper entitled Astronomical Advantages of an Extraterrestrial Observatory. He became the idea's biggest proponent, and was made head of the project in 1965. 
Yes, this is a mission that began formally 54 years ago and has its origins in those far off days after World War I. It is a mission that began its build in 1978, whose mirror was first ground in 1979 and was eventually launched in 1990. 29 years later it is still operating and is expected to do so for at least another decade, possibly two. This is a craft whose name has entered the everyday and is a byword for astronomy and space science. People attribute science to it that it hasn't even done. It is literally in the dictionary. Its results, its story, its images have graced the covers of newspapers. It's appeared in films and TV, has appeared in Lego form, it even had its own IMAX movie, The Hubble. This isn't just a space mission, this is popular culture. Hubble in many respects is little different to any of the other hundred or so space telescopes put up over the last few decades. It wasn't the first space observatory, it's not the most advanced, and its technology is dated. But this scope is the largest in space, and its science output is prodigious. Working in near-infrared, visible light and ultraviolet, the 2.4 meter F24 scope has seen over 15,000 Hubble-based papers published. If you look at astronomy papers in general, about a third are never cited again. This figure is just 2% for Hubble-based publications. This scope has discovered a moon of Pluto, aurora on Saturn, aurora on Ganymede. It watched Shoemaker-Levy slam into Jupiter, revealed protoplanetary disks in M42. It revealed so much about black holes, gravitational lensing, the search for dark matter. It reduced the error in the measurement of Cepheid variables from 50% to 10 and allowed to start pinning down an accurate age of the universe. It has seen further than any optical scope. With the Hubble Deep and Ultra Deep fills, this instrument has seen pretty much as far as any optical telescope can see, including the furthest known galaxy. Then there's those pillars. This isn't just a space mission. This is our window on the universe. And it is the images that are perhaps the Hubble's greatest contribution to not only science, but to global culture. There must be few people on the planet who have not seen a Hubble image. They're everywhere. No astronomy magazine in the last three decades could have been published without at least one. They're on posters, clothing, wallpaper. They adorn classrooms and textbooks in schools in every country. They're used in TV programmes and films, and they will clearly continue to be the case for many, many years. The Hubble palette of colours, the style of images, the sheer range of targets and what they reveal to the person on the street about the universe we are in means that this isn't just a space mission. The Hubble transcends science. This is part of human history. The Hubble Space Telescope. In the pantheon of space greats, the Hubble is an icon. A mission years in the planning. A build delayed by the Challenger disaster. And when it finally got into orbit, it didn't work properly. Cue a series of dramatic space shuttle missions to correct, service and maintain, including the fourth longest spacewalk. Even its story of disaster and triumph is an epic saga. Site corrected, the Hubble has gone on to be one of not only the greatest space missions, but perhaps one of the greatest scientific instruments ever constructed, and one that is also a globally recognised icon, stamping its distinctive palette all over modern culture. Wow. Well, I've got to say that um, Jenny's argument about um, starting off a whole new branch of astronomy and astronomy interest in exoplanets is such a compelling argument and one that I've always, always advocated as being one of the the greatest things in uh, in modern astronomy. But Paul, you reminded me there of just so many things that Hubble did and, and raised so many uh, things there that it discovered from you know moons of Pluto to protoplanetary disks in the, in in the cosmos and 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 the, the contributions that it that it's given to uh, to cosmology as well that many of them I didn't I either didn't remember or I didn't even know that it did and the sheer breadth of what Hubble has delivered means that all the talk about uh, how much it's given us culturally 
and all of the efforts that it was to put something like that in space and to keep maintaining it was almost redundant. The sheer breadth of what it achieved is just so phenomenal when you put it that way. Um, both the arguments were just f phenomenally eloquent, and I can't help but think that that risk that was taken on Kepler in the first place, when we didn't know whether it was going to discover uh, even anything, let alone uh, the sheer breadth of you know 4,000 exoplanets and counting, that's, that's in the data there. Um, it was such a gamble when it first started and it has now become the hottest topic in uh, in astronomy alongside you know the cosmology giants of dark matter and dark energy. But I think I'm going to have to go with Hubble because, um, I, and I didn't think I would do, but Kepler has always been my favourite space telescope project um, and probably the... the the astronomy project that I like above all others, but that argument there and the sheer breadth of what it's done in terms of the the vast amount of research papers and what it's lent its uh, its incredible gaze to in terms of planetary science, in uh, astronomy, astrometry, cosmology, I don't think anything compares with Hubble, um, and uh, it has to go to Hubble, I think. Oh, I think that's fair. <laughs> it was a really good argument. I almost feel sad to say Hubble. I know. But I like what Ralph, you said that like Paul reminded you of like just the breadth of things that Hubble's achieved. And like you did remind me of things that I like, I'd forgotten that it had achieved as well. Uh, yeah. It's an incredible well, very well done. It's it a great that was a great argument about Kepler. I was I that was that was Thank you. Beautifully put. Yeah. Um, yeah, see I've got a soft spot for Kepler too. That's why I wanted to do Kepler because I was like, oh, I think Kepler's the underdog, but I really like Kepler, so I have to fight its corner. Yeah. The other day on uh, when you were discussing this and you were saying you were going to take Kepler, I thought, well, that's that's Jen already won that argument, that debate. But <laughs> with, with, with Hubble, it's so easy to disregard it as being something that creates pretty images. But it's not. It's just so much more than that, isn't it? And it just needs that being brought oh, yeah. to life. And I think this is probably something that's really useful. Not perhaps not 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 necessarily to our listeners, but in the world at large, that telescopes aren't there just for pretty images. That they're no. there for real hardcore science and expanding our uh, understanding of of where we are and our place in the universe and mm. how our universe functions. And I think Hubble. But I think mm -hmm. I think you can't sort of underestimate the the impact of those images. Um, over the sort of last 30 years and, and what that's done for astronomy and the people it's encouraged to go into astronomy and the interest in, in science yeah. and mm. getting things like even though you know, it's horribly delayed and everything but JWST getting that funded and built is it's on the back of things like Hubble and of course if you're selling it to politicians things, you know, it is sometimes it's, it's the pretty images but they are spectacular they are, about yeah. you know, sort of painting this, this this just incredible picture of the universe, because um, people don't don't you know unless you're an astronomer or an astrophysicist, you, the data is just data. You know, it, it's numbers. Yeah. It doesn't mean anything. Yeah. Um, you can you can point to massive piles of data and go look all the data it's presented and look all the papers, but actually it does come down to well look at these incredible images of things we've never seen before. Yeah. Okay, so the question this month comes from our good friend Suki Woods in Norway who says, Loved the piece in your last show about the NASA mission to Titan. It's incredible to think there'll soon be a drone flying over one of Saturn's moon and imagine the pictures and what we'll learn. But wouldn't Enceladus be more interesting with its possibility of life in its liquid ocean? Why did NASA choose a drone for Titan rather than a drill or submersible for Enceladus? What do we think, guys? Cool. I've obviously got my thoughts on this that it's a lot mm. easier to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah I think, that's my immediate thought. <laughs> I'd say I think I think there, there's the the drill on and or the drill on on Europa even or any any of these these ice moons like that. I think that's just really difficult. Yeah, it 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 is another level of of technological complexity that I don't think we have yet. Yeah, yeah, because the thing is, they'd have to. I guess it's the equivalent of dr drilling entirely all the way down through the thickest ice of, like, the Arctic. Oh, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean... That's the sort of thing that we're, we're talking about, and I don't think we've done that. Like, we take ice cores while there's still ice to take cores from, but no one has ever sort of gone straight through all the way down, right? Well, the Russian teams and British teams, Antarctica, have drilled underneath the um, Antarctic ice cap. Um, well, all the way down to the bedrock. All the, all the way down to well, under well, to, to under ice lakes. They've that, got down that to exist. pockets of lakes that haven't yeah. um, surfaced in you know millions yes. of years. Um, and, but uh, but those. I think the point there, though, Paul, is that that's teams of people and with drilling exactly. equipment. Um, yeah, on it's exactly the surface of the earth. What I was going <laughs> to say, yeah, it, it, it's a whole team of people with a base camp, you know running and servicing a massive drill and everything that goes with it you know with sort of the resupply chain back to home and all those things yeah sending a robotic mission to to an ice moon to to drill through what is going to be kilometers and kilometers of ice yeah on casino shows it's on average yeah. 20 kilometers thick and i think yeah. the, the 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 thinnest shells of ice there are about five kilometers thick so and it's going to be more compact than ice on earth because it's so much colder and more frigid there yeah, yeah exactly um, i mean i've seen i've seen i saw a, a, a discussion paper a few years ago about the what it'd have to be would be a sort of it'd have to be nuclear powered clearly um mm-hmm. it'd have to be a sort of a probe that that heated and basically pulled itself melted its, way through. melted its way through the ice very slowly and that's the point it's going to be slowly as well isn't it yeah and the ice above it would, would then refreeze oh um because you couldn't keep it open yeah and there's nothing to keep it warm either so exactly so how so then there's this you know, what do you do to communicate back do you does it just go down and, and then resurface somehow or does it you know trail a cable behind it as this kind of yeah. aerial and i just the the, the the complexity in in that kind of mission it's just, we don't have the technology to do it at the moment yeah it's whereas just, we do but just we drones. Do have drones yeah <laughs> but we have yeah. drones and titan of course has a thick atmosphere that's actually quite similar to Earth's in terms of, of pressure and, and everything. So actually, you say it's not just we have drones. We have drones that are perfectly capable of flying in that kind of atmosphere um, and, and, and working, so we, they work here. So it's not actually, although it's, it's a technological sort of leap and this is going to be a great, great bit of kit, it's not beyond our capabilities. It's also worth noting something that um, something that I saw on a, um, a NASA program actually. So na- uh, at the moment, because of the uh, um, 50 years since Apollo, um, NASA TV is doing some really cool programs on the historical perspective of, of Apollo, but also looking forward to the Artemis program and, and everything that's going on in the, the NASA space program. So I'd really uh, encourage people to watch NASA TV at the moment. But on one of the programs there, when they were talking about the Dragonfly to Titan, they were also saying that if you did the Icarus thing of strapping wings to yourself, to your arms, you could actually fly on Titan because the atmosphere is uh, mm. the atmosphere is thick enough that with the reduced gravity compared to yeah. Earth, you could actually fly with with wing strap to your arms. But <laughs> as if that wasn't cool enough, there's also that's my new destination now. <laughs> oh yeah, what? Yeah, who wants? Who doesn't want to be an angel or an eagle? If anyone ever says, "Where do you want to go in the solar system?" I want to go to Titan. <laughs> but I mean, also it would it would be um, it, it, just from actually you know, why are we going to Titan anyway? This is the only other place we know of with um, a weather system properly. Yeah, that, that's yeah. like Earth's. So that you know, actually we can we can see um, some sort of you know liquid cycle going through the atmosphere, rain lakes flow of flow of liquid it, it, it's it's the closest we found to home and with less concern about contaminating any possible life there because it's less likely there's yeah. life uh, on titan than there is in the ocean of enceladus even as unlikely as yeah, that exactly. is and the last thing we want to do is change the evolutionary direction of uh, another world mm-hmm. by contaminating it yeah yeah, exactly. There's also that argument, you know, the whole thing with Hubble about it's all about the images and stuff that it produces. Like, sending a drone to go and fly over Titan, that's going to bring back amazing oh. footage. Oh, yeah. Whereas for most of the time of a drill on Enceladus or wherever, it's, it's just going to be staring at blank. 
you know, do you know what I mean? You'd be yeah. like, oh, 100 metres down. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I would desperately like to know what's under the oceans of those moons. Oh, yeah. God, I mean, who doesn't? Who do who, who doesn't want to know what's under the, yeah. the ice of Europa and Enceladus and things like that? Who, who doesn't? But we just, we can't do it. Is this yeah. simple answer? Not yet. Not yet. We will. One day we will, I'm sure. But it's we're just not, not we ready can't yet. Do it. Yeah. Let's yeah. wait until we're ready just, for it. Exactly. It's over. Just hear this and I'll go. You gave me more to live for, more than you'll ever know. Sounds a bit mushy to me, to be frank. And that's why we don't often open our hearts. A maudlin Martian is something best left in a sealed concrete bunker. Which is lucky because, until the beginning of next month, that's exactly where we'll remain until Jen can stomach letting us out of our box again. Please tell us you like us. That's it. That's all I've got to say. Write something nice somewhere. Back of a bathroom door. <laughs> you've, heard, you've, you've heard her. She beats us if you don't give us a good review. <laughs> and while Ralph enjoys that, I don't. <laughs> so until next time, it's goodbye from Cydonia Base. Awesome Astronomy is produced at Orbital Sound Limited by Ralph, Paul, Jenny, John and Damien and is free to use and distribute with attribution. We promote general science, astronomy, space science and rational thinking with more resources on our website at awesomeastronomy.com. If you want us to read your comments out on the show, send us your views, opinions, questions or critiques to the show at awesomeastronomy.com. Tweet us at awesomeastropod or give the Awesome Astronomy Facebook page a like and leave your comments there. Thanks for listening and from Sidonia Base, end of transmission. <laughs>